I am Dr. Philip Macmillan. Thank you for joining me again as I continue to explore this issue about myocarditis around COVID vaccines. Now, this topic may be uncomfortable for some people because some don't want to worry about the impacts of this. But you have to remember that vaccines are still being delivered, especially in the younger cohorts who would have been at lowest risk for severe COVID-19, and therefore ensuring safety and effectiveness is absolutely critical. So I will apologize if I make you uncomfortable talking about some of this kind of research. But in truth, my intention is to make the scientific community uncomfortable because we need to maintain standards around what we're doing. Now, just before I start, I'm raising the awareness of the fact that coming up in a few days will be my COVID vaccine myocarditis implications, and I'll be dealing with some of those issues in a bit more detail. So there are a few spaces left. If you're seeing this before the time, please um, click on the link below and you'll be able to join me then. Otherwise, look out for a link to see it elsewhere. So back to the standards. Now, this is around a really important study that was done in May of 2021. And it's called the Big Ten Study. And it was looking at the prevalence of clinical and subclinical myocarditis in competitive athletes with recent SARS-CoV-2 infection. So remember, this was in May 2021. This was nothing to do with vaccines, just to do with infection. Because at that time, even though they were rolling out vaccines, this was not for the younger cohort as yet because it was recognized that they were at much lower risk than the high priority cohort of the population. So it made sense that they were looking at this. Now, this paper was absolutely brilliant. And I went and looked, as usual, at the funding and support for this paper. And you can see down here um, the Jay and Jenny Scott uh, Tenstein family, the Rink family, um, this was part of a cardiovascular research foundation. So these are all private funders who put this together to do probably one of the best studies that we have with regards to identifying myocarditis associated with COVID infection. Now, it's important to remind people that COVID-19 is still a significant disease and it does have risks. As it was pointed out, even in people who don't have severe COVID-19, you can still get significant complications, one of them being myocarditis. That's quite reasonable and important to understand. The question was, was this risk, if this was the main risk, the reason for ensuring that a large cohort of the younger population were vaccinated to prevent this risk from occurring? I don't know if that was the thinking at the time, but it was subsequently shown that myocarditis can also occur with regards to the vaccine. So this was my point. When we looked carefully at the study that was done, this study went through the details of making sure that adequate research was looked into with regards to the risk among the competitive athletes. They looked at a cohort of 1,597 competitive athletes from U.S. colleges who all had COVID-19 and then were screened looking for myocarditis, okay? Now, here is what was interesting with regards to the study. They used four modalities to assess it. And the four modalities were they did an ECG, electrocardiogram, and this is just really about electrical signals in the heart that we are able to use. And when they are having abnormal patterns, we can see 
uh, evidence of underlying cardiac disease. They looked at blood troponin levels. So they measured the troponin levels of blood in the serum of these um, athletes who had myocarditis. They did an echocardiogram as well. That's looking at the function of the heart. And they did cardiac magnetic resonance um, imaging. That's MRI. So four different modalities whilst they were looking for COVID-19. This is very important because I like my audience to be well-educated and you need to understand that this level of research has not been replicated at any point with regards to any of the questions about COVID-19. What they've done is that they have looked at patients who have had myocarditis and they've done research, meaning they've got symptoms of myocarditis, and they have extrapolated that to look at the risk. This research didn't do that. It looked at all the people who were infected and it checked to see whether or not there was subclinical myocarditis. So this is what they found when you looked at the Big Ten study in some more detail. Out of those 1,500 athletes, they found nine of them had cardiac symptoms suggestive of myocarditis. And these are the four tests that they did. So the troponin level in only two of them was elevated. ECG was abnormal in four. Echocardiogram was abnormal in two. And the um, CMR, or the cardiac magnetic resonance imaging, was abnormal in quite a number of them, including late changes with regards to scarring. So this was quite important. But because they did it in detail, they also found a further, almost not quite 37, but 28 um, students who had subclinical myocarditis, probable, and possible myocarditis. Again, in this case, most of them didn't have abnormal um, markers, but they did have some changes with cardiac MRI, which was extremely sensitive. And they followed this up to see how many of them had it resolved. Some of them still had residual damage after the infection. And this was only between four to 14 weeks after the infection. So this was really thorough, detailed research that is the standard that one would expect. What I don't understand is how can you have colleges or universities doing that kind of in-depth research around COVID infection and not replicating that with regards to COVID vaccination? That's really the question. And I can tell you from, uh, from I guess, a, I'd have to say a coroner's point of view, that would be the question that I think the coroner would put to these, um, these institutions. If you've done this kind of research, looking for myocarditis with the infection, how can you justify not doing that kind of research? One, after two doses of the vaccine and then still not doing it after one or two boosters and critically mandating it in some of these facilities. That's almost unbelievable. And I think that this study, you have to remember that this study, this, um, this critical study had a significant amount of citations, over 250 citations. And what that means is that Many papers were written using the evidence that was in this paper, this Big Ten paper. So it was an exceptionally good paper. They were observing from March to December 2020 with regards to infection. Brilliant study that was done. They found that 2.3% were diagnosed with myocarditis. Out of that 1,500 group, 37 athletes, or 2.3%, were diagnosed with clinical or subclinical myocarditis from the infection. It looks as though most of the cases resolved, which is good news. Our challenge is 
what would we find if this study was replicated with regards to COVID vaccination or COVID booster one or COVID booster two? Would we see a similar or even more significant change with regards to heart damage in the younger, healthy, low-risk cohort for severe COVID-19? That's really the research question. And sadly, that's a research standard that hasn't yet been achieved. In the upcoming myocarditis um, discussion, I will highlight a paper that has recently come out which shows a 1 in 35 risk of myocarditis with regards to the booster dose. That is unbelievable. And so it is absolutely critical. And that's only using troponin levels. That's not using the four modalities. In children in Thailand, when they did it, it was one in 43 having myocarditis or pericarditis, and one in three had abnormal changes either on the ECG or in terms of um, some of the troponin levels. This is the fundamentals as to where we are. And this is why when I recently spoke about the fact that it seems that COVID-19 science is irrelevant, this kind of situation reinforces the view that it seems much of the scientific community does not want to know. In my view, that is not acceptable. Look forward to speaking to you all again soon. Have a great day.